Today on Government Matters, it's been one year since the bipartisan infrastructure law was signed, how the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is already spending its portion of the money. The Pentagon approved a request to keep thousands of National Guard troops at the southern border through next summer. Officials eventually want the DHS to operate without this support. We discuss what it'll take to get there. And with the war in Ukraine and tensions over Taiwan as a backdrop, military leaders, international security experts, and lawmakers get ready to meet for an annual forum. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the show that delivers insights on federal government programs, people, and operations. I'm Mimi Gerges. Under the bipartisan infrastructure law signed about one year ago, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was allocated $450 million over the course of five years. Martha Williams is the director of the agency. Martha, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So when people think of infrastructure, they're not really thinking about fish and wildlife. So what's the connection between the two? Well, the connection over time is that think of so many infrastructure projects also have impacts on fish and wildlife. And so when we marry them, we can help communities, we can create jobs, we can have better infrastructure and we can conserve and protect and enhance fish and wildlife. So how big of a difference is this funding going to make for your organization? It's incredible. It's a, it's a watershed moment for the Fish and Wildlife Service and for our partners who work on, on uh, conservation across the country. You've already started some projects. Um, some of the money have, has already been allocated for this year. Can you tell me about how much and how many projects have been started? So we've already allocated over $95 million and over 300 projects. And every one of those projects involves numerous partners, that it's the, the, they're um, brought forward by partners, states, communities, and um, we, we pull together so many different partners on every one of those 300 projects. So let's start talking about some of the projects. One of them is restoring sagebrush country. Explain that. Yeah. So coming from the West, um, the sagebrush country is really this, it's this national treasure, um, not only because of the uh, special habitat and all the species that it covers, encourages, protects, but it's also, I think, this very Western way of life. So by conserving sagebrush country, we're helping communities we're focusing on this way of life and we're really helping to support these iconic species. So thinking of like pronghorn antelope, which are so beautiful, and then a whole bunch of bird species like um, sage grouse for sure, but a number of songbirds. So it's, you know, goes from big game species to birds to fish and to little amphibians. It's, it really runs the gamut. But explain that a little bit more when you say that it's preserving a way of life. Yeah. You know, that's the, sometimes not really understandable for people on the East Coast where this really isn't their way of life. Yes, but it may not be the way of life here, but I think so many of us, you know, to some degree romanticize the West, but it's, you know, when I think of a way of life, I think of people who live on the ground. I think of rural communities and um, then also tribes. You know, we've been very engaged with uh, tribes in um, sagebrush issues as well. Another area of focus is fish passage projects. Yes. Tell us a bit about those and why that's important. So this has been uh, an incredible infusion investment in fish passage. And so if you think of, um, you know, there were a number of, of smaller dams that you may never have really thought about or paid attention to before. But what they do if you're able to remove them or if you're able to, say, change a culvert, it, um, it allows fish to go through and fish are migrate. And we, you know, we learn more and more these fish can go where they used to always go. Somehow when you, I think it's an example of when you give nature a chance, 
it has this remarkable ability to heal itself. So fish can return where they haven't been for over 100 years, for example. But also when you talk about fish passage, it helps with, um, it helps prevent flooding. It helps with water quality. It helps communities. So for example, I went to one of these projects on the Cheat River in West Virginia and um, just saw the incredible community engagement around removing a dam and the recreation and the pride in that community that the project represented. So I'm sure there's a lot of really worthy projects out there. So how do you determine who gets funding and who doesn't? Re a great question. So I think this, this is an example of what we've talked about, the America the Beautiful initiative in the Biden-Harris administration where we really focus on collaborative, community-based projects. So uh, much of this is done through grants and the projects come to Ash either the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation or the Fish and Wildlife Foundation and we then think about the biggest impact to the community, to creating jobs, to the resources and um, how many partners are involved and how we leverage that money. For fish passage projects, we leverage $1 into $6 for every project. So when you, you know, what ultimate impact, Martha, does this, mm -hmm. you know, caring for the nation's uh, uh, fish and wildlife really have on the health of the country? The why. Why do we do this? I mean, I, I would argue that um, nature is so important to us. When we allow people to connect to nature, think of during the pandemic, people went out in droves. It's, so it's crucial to our well-being. I think as people, it's crucial to our communities um, and, and not just on a personal basis, but also, you know, like I said, to prevent uh, flooding to help with in the sagebrush work, to help with uh, drought and fires, to help prevent these enormous fires that are coming across the country. So I think it's giving us a chance and nature's, nature a chance. All right, Martha, thanks so much for being on the program. Nice to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Coming next, with southern border crossings at record levels, the National Guard presence there has been extended for several months. Why some say Customs and Border Protection needs more resources. We'll be right back. The National Guard will be staying put on the U.S.'s southern border, at least through summer 2023. The troop number will be capped at 2,500. Teresa Cardinal-Brown is Managing Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Teresa, welcome. Hi, nice to be here. What are National Guard troops actually doing on the border? Well, I think we need to talk about two different deployments. Um, there is National Guards that have been federalized and are being sent by the Department of Defense. And they are there to support Customs and Border Protection. They are there at the request of the Department of Homeland Security. So they're under a federal authority, which means they can't arrest people, for example. Um, they will be doing support duties uh, for Customs and Border Protection. That means, um, you know, sort of helping with processing and transport, uh, maybe even repairing parts of fence or wall. Um, some Air National Guard may be doing air support with helicopters um, to help identify groups of people coming across the border. But that's the federal deployment. Then you have what Governor Abbott has done with uh, the State National Guard in Texas, and he has invited other governors to send their troops under the governor's authority, and they do do arrests at the border of people they find trespassing on private property. Defense Secretary Austin says that the goal is for the Department of Homeland Security to develop the capability to patrol the border without DOD. Is that realistic, or, or do you think that, um, you know, they're going to be relying on federal troops for some time? Well, the problem there is that it requires Congress to pass enough appropriations to hire additional personnel. Um, one of the things Customs and Border Protection is looking to do is hire people that are in what they call processing coordinator positions. These are non-agent positions, but that can do some of that other 
if you will, back end stuff and free up more Border Patrol agents to be on the border um, doing the law enforcement duties uh, and arrests. But Congress has to approve that, and they haven't approved as many uh, agents as they hoped. You mentioned the state of Texas. Uh, there's about 5,000 troops um, on the border. It's called Operation Lone Star. What do we know about that? So Operation Lone Star is the name of the operation that Governor Abbott has done to deploy Texas Department of Public Safety officials as well as Texas National Guard. And as I mentioned, he's invited other governors to send troops to the border to support that effort. Um, they are operating in, in state control uh, as law enforcement. Um, they are arresting migrants that they find on private property or other properties under trespassing charges. Um, they have then... Uh, uh, ask that they be prosecuted in state criminal courts, although those prosecutions have not gone very well. Um, and most of those uh, migrants that have been arrested have also been released. Uh, Operation Lone Star, I think, also has to do with the buses that the governor has, uh, has authorized to take migrants out of Texas and to other cities like New York. There hasn't been a timeline given for federal troops uh, along the border. Do you expect this to be an indefinite solution? So what's, what's worth understanding here is that federalized National Guard troops have been at the U.S.-Mexico border since the Obama administration. They've had almost continuous redeployments. Um, President Trump did declare a border emergency and authorized a lot more troops. It's now been reduced, as you mentioned, to around 2,500 from what was then a much greater number. But it's a it's been a continual deployment, and I think that's one of the reasons why the defense secretary is saying, hey, Congress, if this is an ongoing thing, it's not a temporary thing, you should really beef up Customs and Border Protection and Border Patrol to do these jobs rather than continually to asking for Defense Department help. And remind us what the, the process is for when migrants are picked up either at a border crossing or illegally. What's the process? Where do, what do they do and where do they go? So a lot of it depends on where they, where they come across the border and how many come at a time. And what we're seeing now is groups of hundreds of migrants arriving in relatively remote places along the border. Um, that then requires Border Patrol to meet them at the border physically. Uh, oftentimes they get buses to come to these remote parts of the border to take them to what are then centralized processing centers. Those who can't be returned directly to Mexico under the CDC, a Title 42 health order, um, are being processed and most are being released into the United States to await court hearings to decide if they can stay and that's going to be uh, three to five years away before they get that decision happens. Teresa, what are the current numbers of migrants coming across and is this a crisis point? So in the last fiscal year that ended September 30th, um, there were more than two million encounters at the U.S.-Mexico border. That includes between ports of entry and at ports of entry of people arriving, the majority of whom are trying to turn themselves in and ask for asylum. About half of those were returned to Mexico under the Title 42, and the other half were processed into the United States in one way or another. You ask if it's a crisis, I say it's been a crisis for years now. Uh, it, is, it is continuing to grow, and I think it really does require some rethinking of how we're going to manage the southern border. And we don't have a lot of time, but what is one of your recommendations to rethink that? So one of the recommendations is to deal with the personnel issues. Um, I think we do need a lot more support personnel to deal with the transportation and care and processing of migrants. Um, CBP, particularly Border Patrol, they are a law enforcement agency. They should not be a migrant handling agency. And we need to get them released back to the border to look for the criminals and the drug smugglers and the other people that we really do have concerns about. But we also need to rethink our migration management at the border, and that means different processes and infrastructure to deal with that. All right. Well, Teresa, thank you so much for coming in. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Straight ahead on Government Matters, more than 300 of the world's top experts, decision makers, and military leaders will meet for the annual Halifax International Security Forum. We talk to the organization's president. We'll be right back. Military leaders, lawmakers, and experts from all over the world are gathering in Canada for the Halifax International Security Forum. It takes place annually in mid-November. Peter Van Praag is the president of the forum. Peter, welcome to the program. Glad to be here, Mimi. So what is the Halifax International Security Forum? So um, we're, we are, despite the name, we're a Washington, D.C.-based organization. Um, but every year we meet in Halifax, Canada, 
Um, it really is a meeting for defense ministers, um, experts, people from civil society, um, from all around the world. But the distinction, Mimi, is that it's really for the good guys. Um, we've, we, we've never had uh, Russian government, Chinese government, Iranian government. It's an opportunity once a year for the good guys co to come together with American leadership and make plans for the year ahead. So you were, obviously Ukraine is gonna be a big topic of discussion, and you were in Ukraine right when Russia was invading. What were you doing there, and what did you see? Um, Mimi, I, I was there. I landed on February 23rd. I went uh, just to deliver a message to um, the government. I, I was in the president's office, President Zelensky's office, on the 23rd. Um, and then overnight um, was when um, President Putin's Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. And I, I left uh, with the help of, of Ukrainians, just regular po folks. And what I saw that day was really a steely resolve. Um, and when I got out and came back and said, Ukraine is not going to fall. Ukraine is going to fight. People, people who hadn't been there and seen what I had seen were doubtful, but now we know um, with President Zelensky's leadership, the Ukrainians have stood firm. But you had also predicted Putin would lose. Yeah. How do you define losing, and do you still believe he, that? He's already lost. Mimi, he's already lost. Um, what happened was, um, you know, after, after we uh, left Afghanistan, and I can go back even further, you know, the world changed on 9-11. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody knows what happened, this, that, and the other, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mistakes were made. Um, and, uh, and then last year, uh, uh, we saw the United States and its allies leave Afghanistan. And I think what the signal then to Mr. Putin was, the West, the United States, it's not going to stand up uh, if I take Ukraine. Um, and by the way, he might have been right. Who stood up? The Ukrainians stood up. President Zelensky stood up. And in return, NATO and the United States have stood firm. And you think it's as a result of their resolve? Yes, it is not a result. If Putin had gone through and won quickly, um, we all would have been scratching our heads what to do next. But it is because President Zelensky and the Ukrainians have stood firm that we have stood firm with them and are providing them the material support that they need. And this has been a shock to the Russians. The Russians have lost more troops in the last nine months than they lost in the entire war in Afghanistan during the 1970s. They, they are in bad, bad trouble. They are hurting. And we are going to be facing a, a world with a much reduced Russia. And we need to make plans for that. Your organization created a Ukraine Victory Fund. Yes, we did. What is that, and why did you create it? Um, we, cre we created that um, early on, uh, assessing what the needs were at that time. The Ukrainians were depending on satellite imagery from governments and, and corporations, and they weren't seeing what they wanted to see themselves. So we raised money to work with a company called Satellogic to launch missi uh, missiles, to launch satellites uh, that the Ukrainians could see and uh, what they wanted to see when they wanted to see it. And that's made a big difference in a number of areas. You said that, you know, uh, Russia was shocked at Ukraine's resolve. The West was shocked. Was China shocked as well? Yes, China was shocked, and China is still shocked, and China is reeling. All of these things, let me just say this, Mimi. Um, Ukraine's going to be successful, and the United States and the American people should be very proud of what, uh, what we are doing to help support. Uh, make, no, make no mistake, the Ukrainians need our, need our support, and in my view, we need to continue uh, su supporting Ukraine as, as best we can. Why? Because every other challenge in the world, including in East Asia and what China is doing, um, becomes much, much more difficult if Putin is successful in Ukraine. So uh, Volodymyr Zelensky and the Ukrainian people are really fighting our fight, and they are paving the way to make uh, Americans' uh, view of the world um, uh, easier going forward. So what other themes are you going to be talking about this year at the Forum? Well, you know, the world is in flux, uh, but like I just said, everything, the world changed uh, um, on February 24th of this year, um, and it really is an opportunity for the United States and its allies to, and we don't get these opportunities, to often to um, regroup and to move forward uh, and learn the lessons of the last 20 years. 
um, and, and meet these challenges. So we'll be talking about East Asia, we'll be talking about China, of course. Uh, um, we're going to be talking about what is going on in Iran. Uh, what's going on in Iran is a revolution, um, and there's going to be changes there. And so what's happened in February with the Russian invasion is that everything is a little bit in flux. Um, everybody, um, nobody really understood how weak Russia was, how its military was. Now we've seen that, and countries that have been depending on Russia for a long time are alarmed. They don't know what they're going to do next. And so really we are starting a new era on the in the world. All right. Well, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing how it goes. Thank you so much, Peter, for being on the program. Thanks so much, Mimi. This was fantastic. If you miss an episode of Government Matters, it's on our website at govmatters.tv. And tell us what you thought about today's program. Send us your comments on LinkedIn. You can follow us at Government Matters Media. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 10.30 on WJLA 24-7 News and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the federal government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges.